Episode one opens with Steve Carell's character, a psychotherapist named Dr. Ellen Strauss, climbing out of bed. And as he tries to leave the room, he realizes that one of his ankles is shackled to the bed. He looks confused and surprised by this. And after failing to free himself, he starts shouting for help. There are some tubes of what looks like toothpaste, a bottle of pills, and on the other side of the bed, there is some toilet paper. So there is at least some consideration for his personal hygiene by whoever kept him chained there, maybe. In what looks like an earlier scene, Alan gets a call from a potential client, Jean Bulger, who needs his help as a therapist. Jean, played by an unrecognizable Domal Gleason, goes in to see Alan and tells him that he's struggling because of some past abuse from his father. Alan has an adult son named Ezra, and one day he brings Ezra a guitar that belonged to Alan's late wife, Ezra's mother. Ezra isn't very moved by the gesture though. In fact, there's no warmth in their interaction and they seem somewhat estranged with Alan trying to reach out and Ezra not very interested. Throughout the episode and the show, more of Alan's family life is revealed through his memories and we'll eventually learn what happened to his wife and how he became estranged from his son. Back to the therapy sessions, there have been a couple of them at this point, enough for Alan to make the assessment that there is no progress. He tells Jean in one of their sessions that he gets the sense that Jean isn't opening up to him and he feels a bit frustrated and he asks if Jean feels the same. He says that Jean needs to be more open and truthful for the process to work. Jean says that he's trying, but even as the viewer, you see that Jean is distracted, holding back. By the way, Jean has read Alan's book on psychotherapy, so he knows of Alan's work and methods. One evening while at home, Alan hears some rattling outside, and when he goes to investigate, he's suddenly frightened by something in the dark, and the next scene opens with him chained to the bed. Jean walks into the room then, very nonchalantly, and tells him that they're in the woods. He needs to calm down. He just needs Alan's help. Jean feels he wasn't getting anywhere in therapy because he couldn't tell the full truth of why he was there. He then tells Alan that his name is actually Sam. Sam is very calm at this point, not psychopathically calm, but just somewhat very reasonable and normal given the very bizarre circumstances. Sam also acknowledges that what he's doing is wrong, but he doesn't feel he has much choice. He then confesses his real problem to Alan that he has a compulsion to kill people. He's acted on those compulsions more than once or twice, and he wants to stop, but he can't. In episode two, Sam is trying to get Alan to eat, telling him that the silent treatment isn't very sophisticated for a therapist. It's mildly upsetting to Sam that Alan points out that he's not his therapist, he's a prisoner, because he knows that Alan is right. Sam doesn't really get angry or lose control. It's more an inconvenience for him, a technicality that he wishes that Alan could get over so that they can get on with it. He then asks Alan if he remembers the John Doe killer. That was Sam's work. He brings out a box of memorabilia, his victim's IDs, wallets and such. You see, they called Sam the John Doe killer because it took time to ID his victims on account of Sam stealing their wallets and identity cards. It's a little distressing that he seems so otherwise normal, maybe even likable. He doesn't express any joy or enjoyment in his deeds or haven't gotten away with them. He's just talking to Alan in fairly neutral tones. And he's more focused on getting help and wanting to stop. Alan does try to unsuccessfully break out of the chains using a plastic fork when Sam goes to work for the day. Finally, Alan decides to sit with Sam. He asks Sam to commit to not harming him or anyone else during their sessions, and if he feels he might, that he should talk to Alan first so that they can address the compulsions. Sam can't commit to that, but he says that he will try. One quite interesting fact about Sam is that he's rather passionate about food. He brings rather interesting takeout for the both of them to share, and his descriptions of food and restaurants are those of somebody who really appreciates unique flavors. Sam tells Alan that right now he has somebody that he set his sights on, somebody he wants to kill, and he's been wanting to do this for four months. That's how long he's been fighting the urge. He's really struggling. In this case, the guy who Sam wants to kill was very condescending towards him in his role as a restaurant inspector. This is Sam's job, when he went to go and inspect the guy's restaurant. These scenes, by the way, are all taking place in the basement of a house, and often when Sam leaves, it sounds as though there are footsteps above. At the end of this episode, Alan calls out to the person who the footsteps above belong to, and we see them slowly come down the stairs with a crowbar, seemingly more to protect themselves than to attack Alan. In episode three, it turns out that the footsteps belong to a woman named Candace. 
Sam's mother. Sam had moved back into her home when he split up with Mary, his ex-wife, and Candace says she knows how terrible this is, as in Sam's compulsion to kill. Alan tries to appeal to her to call the police, but she tells Alan that he has to help her son. Sam tells Alan about his father then, reluctantly. You see, he doesn't really want to talk about his parents. In fact, he'd earlier lied and told Alan that his parents had died because he had no interest in these therapy sessions coming back to them. About his mother specifically, Sam says something along the lines of, in therapy it always comes back to the mother, and she has nothing to do with this. We do find out though that Alan's abusive father left when he was 14 and he does talk a little bit about life before his father left. We get another memory then of Alan's son Ezra, his wedding, and how Alan's wife, Ezra's mother, caused a stir by singing something that's not done by women at Orthodox Jewish weddings. Alan's late wife insisted though at the time on singing and it's really bad. Her son Ezra and his wife look deeply upset by it and some people actually walk out of the wedding. This is the main reason for the parents' estrangement from Ezra. Although Alan was a bit more accepting, or he tried to be, his wife had trouble with Ezra's conversion and she made it known. Back in the present, Alan suggests to Sam that they have some family therapy sessions with his mom. Alan assures Sam that he doesn't need to go through this alone. He asks Sam to try and protect his mother from her pain by trying to curb his own impulses. Sam tells Alan that he went back to the restaurant where the guy is. He didn't do anything, but he says that he wants to show the guy how to behave and how to treat other people. When Alan asks if he feels as though Sam needed to teach his other victims a lesson, Sam says yes, they all deserved it. The next time Sam comes home, he has someone with him, still alive and with their eyes duct taped shut, and he drags this potential victim into the next room as Alan looks on in horror. By episode four, Alan is in deep distress at this point because after four months of being able to resist, Sam has given in, bringing him one step closer to committing murder. Sam talks to Alan then about his love for Kenny Chesney concerts and, and about how his then wife went to two of them with him. He says that he's been to over 20 concerts and he has a friend who's been to over 70. They're all a community called the No Shoes Community where everyone is happy and peaceful. Now Sam lies quite a lot, but with very specific purpose and only for as long as the lie might be useful. And then he tends to come clean. Like he lied about his job at first because he figured that Alan would use that information to identify him to the police, but he often ends up owning up to his lies eventually. It's not at all clear at this point if this is a real Kenny Chesney fan club he's talking talking about here or if it's some kind of code name for a murder club. Sam tells Alan that he's never been able to stop himself once he started the process of killing somebody, but he had managed this time to bring the guy Elias home, which is something that he's never done. So this is a delay in carrying out the deed, which in some way is progress, but that also increases the stakes because he has such easy access to his victim now. He's also starting to unravel and he doesn't know how long he can hold out. Candace comes down then and she apologizes on Sam's behalf as though he has bad manners or something. She's a fascinating character because it's not that she's afraid of him. She's not being held hostage there. I wondered at this point if he had maybe inherited some kind of psychopathic traits from her because she doesn't have much concern for a victim's lives or Alan the hostage if she's not going to the police. Her main priority is to protect Sam and get him help, even in this unorthodox way. The guy in the bathroom, Elias, starts talking to Alan and we find out more about Alan's wife. There are signs throughout the show that the wife passed away recently and that she was unwell. Alan says then that she died from cancer months ago. Alan, realizing that Elias might be on borrowed time, encourages Sam to go to work to shift his focus somewhat. Sam does do it and he makes it through the day with incredible difficulty. He's on the brink, but every time he's about to give in, Alan manages to pull him back. It's tense though, because there's a very real chance that Sam might be able to fight this. He's desperately trying, and you obviously can't help but root for somebody who doesn't want to commit murder. In episode five, at Alan's suggestion, Sam goes to visit his ex-wife, Mary. She has a 12-year-old daughter, and Sam asks how she is, and it's not clear at first if it's a child that they share. Mary says then that she, quote, has another one, and she shows Sam a photo and there's a Project Next Generation logo on it and the child is of a different race and ethnicity to her. So it looks like some kind of mentor program. We do find out later, Sam tells Alan, that they adopted a child but 
she lives in Bangladesh. So basically they sponsor this adopted child from abroad. The visit with his ex-wife goes kind of how you might expect any visit with an ex to go if the relationship didn't end too terribly. It's awkward, there isn't much to talk about beyond the pleasantries, but they do seem to generally like each other. Also, it seems like the Kenny Chesney thing is not a euphemism for Murder Club. Sam is genuinely a fan of him. The guy in the bathroom, Elias, asks Alan to suggest to Sam that he come out of the bathroom for a therapy session. All three of them. Sam tells Alan that he liked seeing his ex, but it didn't achieve anything. He goes to the bathroom then and says that he needs to do this, but then Alan shouts for Candace to come down the stairs. She does, and she basically yells at Sam and tells him, like you'd imagine a mother would tell her teenage son, to go to his room. This kind of works for now. He's in his room, chatting in a forum, listening to Kenny Chesney, and he even tries to watch some adult content to try and take his mind off of things. Elias lives to see another day. Alan tells Sam that due to his childhood, he has become very angry and he feels that Sam is looking for people and making an excuse to act out his violent tendencies. It's not that those people deserve it, as Sam says. At the end of the episode, Sam brings Elias out to talk in this therapy session, and Alan gets him to talk to Sam about himself and his recipe at the restaurant, because remember, Sam does have an interest in food. Just then, Sam can't take it anymore, and he goes over to strangle Elias Alan is screaming at him to stop, and he's also screaming for Candace to come down, but she's in bed, terrified of coming down. In the end, we see Sam finally taking a breath after it's done. After four months, there seems to be some kind of relief, momentarily at least. I think that this needed to happen because the show kind of makes you forget that he's a monster in a way. Sure, the premise is that he's a serial killer, but for the most part, up until this point, he just seems like a man in distress who's really trying very desperately to get some help. In episode six, Candace tells Sam that she almost dialed 911 and she's at her wit's end. She tells him not to give up on therapy and she's very much his enabler and even accomplice at this point as she stands by not reporting her son. Alan, who is really struggling, seems to have his own therapist in his mind named Charlie, who is actually Alan's dead therapist. The conversations in his mind are his way of disassociating, he says. Alan tells Charlie that he isn't trained in psychopathy in order to effectively deal with Sam's case. He needs a plan. He thinks that Sam might have a conscience. It's tiny, but it might be there somewhere. All this time, Sam is calmly taking care of the body disposal. He seems to be digging a grave in the next room in his basement. His hands stop blistering though after a while and he gets Alan to finish the dig. Alan suggests that Sam rather leave the body somewhere that it can be found. That would be the most respectful thing to do. Sam is worried about it being tracked back to him, but you can see that he's thinking about it. Alan gets Sam to take the blindfolds off of Elias and tries to help him develop his empathy skills. Sam then eventually agrees to leave the body where it can be found by Elias's family. And while Sam is in the bathroom, Alan writes a kind of SOS note and shoves it into Elias's mouth. Episode 7 starts off as a Charlie episode. Alan is anxious about the note that he put in Elias's mouth and how dangerous it would be for him if it came out while Sam was trying to dispose of the body. Obviously Sam might then kill Alan next. Or who knows, things go well and the coroner finds the note and he gets rescued the next day. Sam goes to talk to one of his old high school teachers and eventually tells him that he doesn't think his life is going well and he's not happy. He asks this teacher if if he had any idea from when he was a kid that things might have turned out like that for him. Sam asks his teacher then if he could be his therapist. You see, Alan is still not really in the position to be a present therapist at the moment on account of the general trauma of the situation, and especially the murder that happened in front of his eyes. Although before the murder of Elias, they were starting to get comfortable with each other as therapist and patient. Also, Sam killed somebody while being a patient of Alan's, and while Alan is not at all responsible for this in any way, the therapy doesn't seem to be taking. Sam even calls his ex-wife to try and find some answers, but this is a frustrating dead end. Ellen talks about how his son and his in-laws treated him and his wife like second-class citizens, not Jewish enough. And when Ellen's wife got sick, Ezra couldn't accept that she wanted to go through euthanasia. Ellen says that since then, he'd been trying to reach out to Ezra, but nothing. Sam comes home one day and tells Ellen that he'll print a prayer that Ellen had forgotten. 
This is a display of empathy, of course, because he saw that Alan needed the prayer and it upset him that he couldn't recite it off by heart. This could also just be Sam being pragmatic, though, because while it is a thoughtful gesture for most people, judging from what we've seen so far of Sam, it could be that it just makes sense for him to print it because Alan couldn't recite it, and there's not much more to it. Actually, Sam buys a printer in order to do this. Sam does say that he doesn't feel good. It seemed as though the very momentary relief he felt just after the act is now gone. A murder hangover, if you will. Sam reveals then that he did not put the body somewhere where the family would find it. He hid it. This means that nobody's going to find Alan's note. Sam is too paranoid about this being tracked back to him. At the end of the episode, Alan reads the poem called a Kaddish in Hebrew. Sam had asked Alan if he could listen to Alan recite it, and Alan had said no, that it's private. Sam ends up listening through the door, and it's beautifully recited by Alan in a very desperate moment, feeling that his last hope of getting out is now gone. In episode 8, Sam is at work and he has a slight disagreement with his boss about inspection wait times, but his boss makes this comment, when you have my job, you can do that, but for now, do yours. You're good at it. Condescending, sure, an inappropriate way to talk to an employee, but ultimately harmless. It's just the kind of comment, though, that could set Sam off, and it does. Sam stalks him, follows him after work. He manages to talk his boss into going behind the dumpster to check something out. They then have an argument as Sam accuses his boss of taking a bribe from a restaurant. They get into an altercation, and Sam quickly overpowers his boss and murders him. He then recites the Kaddish in broken Hebrew, and afterwards he calls his teacher about the therapy sessions, and the teacher agrees to help him. We see Ezra then, who has been putting up missing flyers for Alan. That evening, he brings some sweets back for his kids, and this seems confusing and upsetting to them. Perhaps the sweets were not kosher? It's never really explained. It could also be that the kids know that Alan is missing, but since Ezra was quite estranged from his father, I don't think that it's that. Later, Ezra is playing music in his car, and I wonder again if Orthodox Jews are allowed to listen to secular music. He goes and checks on his dad's house and the guitar is there and he, he takes it out, plays it and starts singing the Country Road West Virginia song. He later tells his wife then that when his mom died he was really harsh and he was just so mad at his dad. Obviously it's very heavily implied here that he has some regrets about the relationship with his parents. And now with both of them potentially gone, seems to maybe be giving him some perspective. While playing a game of ping pong at the house, Sam tells Alan that he murdered his boss and that his compulsions are getting worse. This is the second one in days. He tells Alan that the therapy isn't working and that it was a mistake to bring Alan to the house. He's never hurt anybody he's liked before, but he might have to kill Alan and he asks Alan how he'd like to be killed. Alan responds by telling him a joke about three men a Jewish one, a French one, and an Englishman. They're all sentenced to death and they're asked how they'd like to be executed. The French man chooses the guillotine, the English man chooses a firing squad, and the Jewish man says he'd like to die of old age. Sam tells Alan that he's asked his old teacher to be his new therapist. Alan seems to understand what this means, as do we. In episode nine, Alan has been fashioning this shiv out of his empty foot cream tube. He's been sharpening it on the edge of the bed whenever Sam goes off to work. He later tells Sam that he shouldn't look for a new therapist. He's come to care about Sam and they just need more time to work on it more. Alan talks Sam into inviting his ex-wife Mary over for brunch and he says that if he explores some meaningful relationships in his life, this could help with his fixations. Sam will have Mary over upstairs and Alan will watch their interactions on the nanny cam. Sam isn't thrilled about this idea. He thinks that it's dishonest, which is a little ironic coming from a murderer, but he does go along with it. He is quite trusting. So the brunch happens and it's an awkward disaster at first. They have nothing to talk about and Sam tries to tell a joke, but it fails. Sam runs down to the basement and asks Alan's advice. Alan has his shiv in his hand at the ready. This is his moment. But in his mind, Charlie tells him that he'll get Mary killed. Alan decides then not to go through with attacking Sam. He also imagines himself calling out for help, but he doesn't. Alan eventually tells Sam that the root of Sam's anger might be his abusive father, that he kills people instead of his father because he can't kill his father. This sparks an interesting thought in Sam's head and he shows Alan a video of Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer, I believe, saying that in his murders, he was killing other people, but he was kind of killing his mother. And when he killed his actual mother, that was the end of it. 
Then Sam decides that that's what he needs to do. He needs to kill his father. Alan tries to stop him, but Sam already has his coat on and he's out of the door. Alan calls Candace down in a panic. He tells her that Sam has gone off to kill his father and that he thinks it would help cure him. Candace literally asks in that moment, would it? And it was pretty funny given how serious the situation is. She makes it clear that she doesn't really care what happens to Sam's father, but Alan is still trying to appeal to her. Candace tells Alan that she's been in this position many times and there's nothing that they can do about it. The best thing she says is to have a beer and relax. She tells Alan that she's not a monster. She's sad about the life that Sam lives. She makes up stories in her head about the families of the people who lost somebody because of Sam. Alan asks about calling the police, but she says she cannot. Sam, meanwhile, is at his father's house. The dad makes them a sandwich and they're sitting at the table and Sam asks why his dad hit him as a kid. His dad says he didn't know, but he felt bad at the time. Then his dad tells him that he just wasn't like other kids. He wouldn't listen, he had no friends, and he goes, anyway, I'm sorry, as he tucks into his sandwich, very nonchalantly. Then Sam strangles his father to almost the point of death. He stops then and says that his therapist said not to kill him. He tells Alan later that he didn't want to do it. The hatred ended up making him not want to. Alan tells him that this is a major breakthrough. He stopped himself. Sam is anxious but pleased. I believe this is the first time he genuinely laughs or smiles and it's clear that Alan's positive reinforcement really matters to him and that he's proud that he managed to do it even though he is still cautious. Alan tells Sam then that it's time to let him go. He needs to get back to his own son. He tells Sam that as a therapist he has a legal obligation to keep his confidence. He can't report his past crimes and then oh no Sam pretty much ignores him and tells him that therapy takes years and so he'll get Alan a TV and a couch to make him more comfortable. It looks like Alan is going to be there a while. Alan tells Sam that he has something to say. He can't treat Sam anymore. He says that Sam needs to be physically stopped from carrying out his crimes. That way he can focus on really healing. He needs to turn himself in. Alan says that it's time. Alan refuses. He won't live down there as a pet. So Sam has a choice. Either let Alan go or solve things another way. Sam says that... Both options are bad. He does not want to choose. But he does drive down to the police station and he sits in his car across the road. Candace tells Alan that she knows that he wants to go home, but Sam just isn't ready. He tells her that when Sam was young, even though she, his mother, didn't know what to do and none of it was her fault, she didn't protect Sam from his father. Then, in a moment, Alan has Candace hostage with his shiv to her neck. He wants Sam to call the police. Sam calls Alan's bluff. Of course, he doesn't believe that Alan has it in him to harm his mother. We see the shiv start to puncture Candace's neck and then we don't know what happens because we shift to a scene where Alan is having a happy dinner and an evening of singing with his son's family. Then in the present we see that Sam has his hands around Alan's neck as his mom begs him to stop. Obviously Sam overpowered Alan. Sam then unshackles Alan and puts him in the shallow grave that was made for Elias. He then sits and reads a note that Alan had written earlier. You see the moment that Alan decided to tell Sam that he wouldn't treat him anymore, he knew his fate. Sam types a letter telling Alan's children, Shoshana and Ezra, that their father is dead. And because bodies are an important part of, in this case, Jewish funerals, he writes in the letter where he left the body and he includes the letter that Alan himself wrote to his children. The letter expresses his love for them, how much they mean to him, and he tells them that he never suffered and for them not to remember their conflicts. Meanwhile, Sam has Alan's voice in his head now and he sees him still. He pledges then never to hurt anyone again, even though the voice in his head, which is Alan's voice, tells him that he can't help himself. He will do it again. He decides then to chain himself to the bed the way Alan was chained and he gives his mother the key. At the end of the episode, we see Ezra checking in with a therapist. He says that he's worried for his kids, his wife, his sister, and it's been difficult for him too, but he's okay. Just as Ezra is about to tell the therapist more about himself, the credits roll, and that is the end of the episode and the end of the show. Now, I was left with so many questions, but the ending was such a satisfying one to me. Not that I think that they could have really ended it in any other way. I don't think Sam really cared about the people that he killed. Obviously, he felt they deserved it. He cared about himself, which is why he never turned himself in and was never going to. Sure, he desperately wanted to stop, but not enough to inconvenience himself. Plus, his future victims would have been a difficult but ultimately acceptable consequence of his compulsions to him and his enabling mother. And another thing, 
During the first half of the show, I kept trying to see whether Sam displayed any signs of genuine empathy, but I eventually just figured that he just responds to situations in the most expedient way. And sometimes that aligns with an empathetic approach. I also thought it was so consistent with Sam's character that in the end, he knew that it was important to Alan that Sam's victims deserve to have the bodies of their loved ones, but Sam himself didn't really care about that. I did kind of want this to mean something about Sam's possible rehabilitation or his closeness with Alan. But ultimately, if there were any way that this would be traced back to him, I don't think that he would have done it. It mattered to Sam to do right by Alan, even given the circumstances. And he did try to throughout their interactions, but it always had to be on his terms. I would highly recommend the show. Demel Gleeson is excellent always, and I really enjoy Steve Carell and dramatic roles. And yeah, if you've seen it, feel free to share your thoughts and thank you for watching.